There we go. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin D. Richard, and I'm the Curator Supervisor of the Oil Museum of Canada National Historic Site, and I'll be the moderator today for Fun in the Sun, Past Summer Recreation in Sarnia Lambton, which is presented with uh, members of the Heritage Sarnia Lambton Museum Network. I want to start off by saying a big thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Um, hearing there's lots of power outages, so thank you for uh, making it. And uh, I want to thank our amazing panelists for sharing their knowledge with us. Uh, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy, and we appreciate you guys taking a moment of your day to spend some screen time with us. If you've not done one of these webinars before, I'm just going to take a moment to explain how you participate. So you'll see some slides on the screen and uh, the um, videos of the presenters. And um, if you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to use the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of the screen, uh, to type out your questions. And you can ask throughout the presentations, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Lori Webb is joining us as well, and she's going to be taking care of any technical issues. So if you have any problems, um, she can try to help you. You can message her directly in the comments section. Um, as well as you can use the comment section to make comments and uh, socialize with the group. And uh, you can do that by selecting all panelists. Um, so that way everybody can see it. So today's webinar will be about an hour long and I'll be introducing each presenter as we go. We will finish with some quick announcements and the Q&A and we'll be wrapping up about 7.30. And as well, we are recording this webinar so that way you can watch it again or um, tell your friends to, to watch it. So let's begin. First up, we have Dana Thorne. Dana is the Curator Supervisor at the Lambton Heritage Museum. She previously worked as archivist at the Lambton County Archives. And I'm gonna share my screen right now before we start. I should have checked that before. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Hey, great. Um, well, good evening to everyone joining us, and thank you, Erin, for uh, the introduction. I'm uh, really pleased to be joining you tonight to share about one of the summer gems that has entertained visitors uh, in Lambton County for decades throughout the 1900s. Grand Bend is a well-known summer destination. It's located only eight kilometers north of us at the Lambton Heritage Museum. The beaches, cottages, and shops are a popular tourist draw. Can I have the first slide, Erin? My computer is lagging, so one moment. <laughs> well, in, in the slide, um, you're going to see two different versions of the Grand Bend welcome sign. It was located on Main Street, just south of the intersection on Highway 21. Um, so the picture of the old sign is juxtaposed with the new sign that's now in about the same location. These signs uh, welcomed visitors to a summer in Grand Bend full of possibilities. So years ago, a popular dance hall was one of the local summer staples in Grand Bend. Um, get the second slide, please. Just as I catch up. <laughs> Perfect. So this uh, popular dance hall was known as the Lakeview Casino. So it wasn't a, um, a, a gambling casino in the way we think of um, in Las Vegas having casinos. Um, it was more of a, a dance and a recreation spot. This building was located on the Grand Bend Beach just at the end of Main Street. The concept started in, 19, or in 1898 with a developer named John Spackman. He launched the Lakeview House, which was part cottage and part recreation center. On fine summer evenings, concerts were held around a roaring bonfire. A London grocer named George Eccleston saw the potential in this land and he bought the property for $9,100 in 1916. Eccleston's ambitious plans included road improvements, uh, rental of rowboats and bathing suits on the beach, and a diving platform for swimmers. For evening entertainment, a dance hall of frame construction was built on the beach. Um, can I get the next slide? And you'll be able to see that, uh, that frame building. The official opening took place on July 29, 1917, with the Guy Lombardo Orchestra from London, Ontario, providing the music. This was actually the Lombardo's first professional engagement, for which they earned a whopping $10. They went on to have a very successful career. 
The popularity of the dance hall over the next two seasons warranted the construction of a larger, more permanent structure. Can I get the next slide, please? Sure. Yep. The, uh, the new building made with poured concrete walls was completed in 1919. George Eccleston continued to run the business until his death in 1931. His wife Ida took over until 1937 when she sold the business to her daughter Ella and Ella's husband, Eric McElroy. Um, Ella, you can see that picture here. Ella once said, my dad had great visions and Eric was able to carry some of them out. Uh, the McElroys operated the casino from 1937 until they sold it in 1966. While music was important at the Lakeview Casino, the beach was also a main attraction. The next slide, please. Uh, visiting the beach was an important part of the experience. Uh, you can see sunbathers in the picture on the left side. And on the right is an artifact from our museum collection that was an important tool for an afternoon of summer bliss. This swimmer's basket ensured that you could enjoy the beach carefree. At the casino bathhouse, you would load your clothes into the basket and receive a number. You traded this number back at the end of your swim to retrieve your belongings. This particular swimmer's basket dates back to the 1920s and 1930s, and it may have been manufactured locally at the Forest Basket Company. The next slide, please. The Lakeview Casino also had ball games and a picnic area. Other beach amenities were rowboats, bathing suit rentals, and a diving platform. The other main attraction at the Lakeview Casino was the music. Uh, next slide. Here you can see two different pictures of the interior taken at different points of time. Uh, patrons purchased the general admission ticket for 15 cents, which gave you entry only as far as the promenade surrounding the dance floor. Once inside, a pay-as-you-go system known as jitney dancing was in effect. Individuals purchased additional tickets for five cents each, and these entitled them to one dance. After each song, the floor was cleared of all of the dancers. After tickets had been collected for the next song and the couples assembled on the dance floor, the orchestra would start playing again. Next slide, please. Uh, some big names played the Lakeview Casino over the years. This poster is from our archival collection and promotes a show by the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. Other talent that played the Lakeview Casino included the Glenn Miller Orchestra, Gordy Tapp, the Haynes Sisters, Wally Coster, and Stan Patton. Next slide, please. Even Louis Armstrong played here. This poster from our museum collection advertises one of his summer gigs. And the picture on the right is from one of the shows that he performed here in Grand Bend. We also have some signed portraits of Louis Armstrong in our museum collection. Those are on the next slide. Black entertainers like Louis Armstrong were permitted to entertain the crowds, but racism was very much present at the Lakeview Casino. A prominent sign at the entrance to the dance hall read Gentiles only, and Jewish visitors were banned from entering the building. It's important to remember that rooted racism is not just an American problem, that it was also prevalent and remains today in many of our Canadian institutions. There are some other interesting artifacts in our collection uh, from the Lakeview Casino. This green leather stool was used in the canteen area. The base was bolted to the floor and visitors could swivel on the seat while enjoying their cocktails. I bet that many enjoyable summer nights were spent on these chairs. Uh, next slide. We also have this oval shaped microphone which was used on the main stage of the casino. It's fun to look at this microphone and imagine all of the well-dressed and sophisticated singers that crooned into it over the years. Next slide. These uh, interior pictures of the casino allow you to see um, where the band would have been set up on the main stage. During the 1960s, the music at the Lakeview Casino changed with the times. Rock and roll became popular and bands with names like the Creeps and the Reefers tried to coax younger audiences onto the dance floor. However, the popularity of old style dance floors from the big band era was waning. The next slide. The Lakeview Casino was sold to a firm in, from Windsor in 1966. The business shifted to a pinball arcade and a fast food restaurant until it was destroyed by fire in 1981. The grand old lady of the beach at the bend was no more, but her memory lives on for so many visitors that dance the nights away at the Lakeview Casino. Thank you so much to everyone for uh, listening to my presentation. Looking forward to hearing the rest of our speakers tonight.
All right, thank you. Now I'm just gonna see if I can actually get it to work properly. And I'm gonna introduce our next uh, panelist, which is Nicole. So uh, next we have Nicole Azalis, who is the current archivist in Lampton, at Lambton County Archives. Previous to this, Nicole was a curator of the Museum of Ontario Archaeology for five years, where she oversaw both online and in-house exhibition development and managed archaeological and ethnographic collections. Her educational background includes an honors degree in classic archaeology with a minor in ancient languages, postgraduate certificate in museum and gallery studies, and certificates in both creative writing and project management. Uh, I think I you, there you go. <laughs> and I'm going to gr grab your uh, slides. Thank you, Aaron. So as Erin does that, um, my chat today will be on the old boy reunions of Lambton County. Uh, so the first slide, once it's up, uh, shows Victoria Hall decorated. Is this it? No. No, okay, <laughs> hang on. It's a beautiful photo though. <laughs> there we go, the next one. Number 18. Uh, this one? There we go. <laughs> so uh, this is a really... Oh, okay. We're going to have to suffer through this. Sorry, go on. <laughs> right. So once we get the image up, it's a beautiful uh, photo of Victoria Hall decorated for the one of the earlier old boy reunions in Lambton County. Um, you'll notice in the photo that halfway up the tower there is a very brave gentleman uh, putting up some decorations. So it's uh, pretty death defying at that moment. So like I mentioned, my chat today will be on the Old Boy Reunions of Lambton County. I'll be focusing specifically on the Petrolia Old Boys Reunions. However, I'd like everyone to recognize that these reunions did happen all across the county and the wider community, which also included local communities such as Alvinston, Watford, Forest, and Marthaville, among many others. And they were a fantastic demonstration of the local pride and identity. So these... These reunions were often years in the making and the majority of them took place in mid to late August. So decorations and flags spread across roads, businesses and homes as men and women flooded the streets, some for the very first time in decades. It was an event that wasn't just about the shows, the competitions and the celebrations. It was a lot about the sharing of stories between old friends as they reminisced well into the evening about times passed while discussing tales of their adventures abroad. So where did it all begin? What's some of the inspiration behind these events? Uh, one of the many stories behind these reunions takes us back to the early days of Petrolia when after the oil boom slowed, citizens took their talents to pioneering the petroleum industry in oil fields across the world. These individuals are commonly known as the hard oilers, but can also be called uh, foreign drillers or international drillers. So most old boy reunions across the county began after 1900. Uh, the first one in Petrolia specifically was held in 1908 and took place August 12th to 14th. This one was advertised for several years beforehand. It was very important to connect with the hard oilers and have them make arrangements to take their leaves to coincide with the event. As a result, hundreds of former residents returned and it was a very, very successful event. The second reunion uh, in 1925 was once again very successful. Years in the making, months of planning, uh, brought a number of former residents back to the community. Uh, this one, it was stated that as in the Sarnia Canadian Observer, June 17th, 1925, that quote unquote, this program is the most elaborate in every detail and there's enough of it to stretch out over an entire 24 hours in a day. Uh, the earlier ones specifically, you'd see in a lot of the old boys reunions, dancing every night, shows every night, parades, uh, ball games were fully functional during these parades and during these events. Uh, later in 1946, uh, Petrolia held a third reunion. 
This one was organized uh, to bring back about 1,200 people, which was hugely successful. And this one was led under the chairmanship of R.A. Stedman. Here, each citizen in the community would be asked to provide a list of those whom they would like to have invited. Many, many letters of invitation were sent out all across the world and the archives has at least 30 letters of former residents that were returned uh, detailing the payment and excitement for the upcoming reunion and payment was a one dollar membership fee uh, the ticket was then either picked up either at the event or could be mailed out beforehand and this included a program as well uh, the last old boys reunion in Petrolia happened in 1966 to coincide with the Petrolia Centennial. Uh, it was a week-long affair happening, I believe, just before Labor Day. And it, again, was hugely successful with thousands of people attending. Uh, these reunions, however, they were hardly new and, and not just local. So it's noted in 1946 in the newspaper that a leather and goods merchant in Petrolia, Mr. Germain, uh, had collected many, many group images of organized Petrolia old boys reunions that happened in Australia, Iran, and other countries where hard oilers could be found. Often these reunions were con connected with these sensational stories recounting an unexpected meeting of friends when neither really had any expectation of seeing each other again. Uh, so the next slide is the 1946 reunion program front. And we're gonna, Baron can get her up there. <laughs> uh, so in the meantime, we'll talk about these sensational stories to be had. Well, there was one shared in the London Free Press, August 21st, 1946, that features Mr. George Gregory, who drilled in about a half dozen countries overseas. He discussed his time in Shanghai while riding a rickshaw when he heard a shout of hard oil, which brought him to a halt. In this state of confusion, he heard a laugh, looked up and saw an old chum from Petrolia on the window above. His friend had seen him from the club and shouted these two magic words, which brought Mr. Gregory to a halt. As another story goes, it was also said that if a driller stood in London, England's Piccadilly Square and shouted hard oil at the top of their lungs, some petroleum would come rushing to greet you. Now, the story even went so far to maintain that one oil man actually did this successfully, although not proven, but possible. So the next slide um, shows the Watford Old Boys street decor in 1907. It's a presentation about fun in the sun. So I wanted to kind of separate out the activities from some of the main years and, and going on to get these events going. Uh, so some of the activities to be had at these events, you'd often find families spending time at the Midway, enjoying delightful food and games, barbecues put on by local organizations and businesses, almost pretty much daily, usually for lunch, sometimes dinner, while there were sport teams that came together for, for activities such as horse races, which we saw uh, news articles in 1925, uh, baseball games, since the very first one, baseball happened every single boys reunion from what I saw in, in most of the news articles from various ones across the county here. And in the later ones, a lot of high school football was incorporated as well. Parades often started the union, uh, uh, reunion, and there were a couple reunions that had multiple parade, parades throughout. Band performances, antique car shows, dancing every night, stock shows, church services, archery stage shows, fireworks, all of these grand things were all very commonplace at the old boys reunions across the county. There were even competitions such as the best float uh, in the parade, um, and quirky ones such as the most colorful beard. Uh, there's also one year in Petrolia where when veteran oil drillers returned, uh, they were, Petrolia was digging a new oil well on the parade grounds. And so the drillers had a lot of interest in it and uh, the oil, the well did end up producing oil, which is fantastic. 
a title together. So these reunions were packed full of events that provided joy and entertainment to all those who attended. But it was really the stories that were created as a result that helped facilitate such a meaningful and lasting memory of the old boys reunions. And this is reflected in a lot of the letters that were sent out in 1946 of, of people recanting their experiences at previous ones and families coming together if there weren't enough hotels to host people who were coming back and really bringing together this local pride and, and identity, as I mentioned before, to, to really create these amazing experiences that are told in all of the artifacts and, and stories for generations to come. Thanks. All right, thanks, Nicole. So up next, we have Lori Mason. Lori has been the curator of Moore Museum for 35 years. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Education degrees from Brock University, as well as a, certif a certificate in museum studies from the Ontario Museums Association. Moore Museum began in 1975 in the former Moortown School and has grown over the past 45 years to a 13-building community museum showcasing the social, agricultural, and marine history of the former Moore Township section of the St. Clair Township. Whoop. One second. You have to unmute yourself, Lori. There you go. Okay. Well, that's right. well thanks, Erin. And good evening, everyone. Um, as soon as I heard that tonight's presentation's theme had been chosen as summer fun, my mind went automatically to the St. Clair River. Uh, I grew up inland at Brigden, and my favorite days as a kid were when my family would pack up and head out to the river. We'd picnic, we'd splash around in the water, watch the ships go by, and that type of thing. Um, St. Clair River has always played a large part in summer fun in St. Clair Township. Um, nowadays, it's more power boats and jet skis. Um, in my day, it was water skiers and air mattresses. Um, but I'd love to be able to take a trip back in time to late 19th or early 20th century when the type of ship that you see in this slide um, would be seen sailing by. Uh, beginning in the late 19th century, um, day excursions were offered on passenger steamers. This one's the Tajmu, which was a popular one. Um, it would take passengers to Stag Island or to Tajmu Park on Harsons Island. The Tajmu was uh, run by the White Star Line. Um, the five ships of the White Star Line were um, estimated to carry three quarters of a million passengers in each season during the height of their business in the 1890s through to the early 1920s. Uh, next slide shows the Omer de Conger, um, another popular one. It was actually originally a ferry between Sarnia and uh, Port Huron, but day excursions down the St. Clair River were later offered. Um, an afternoon excursion uh, in 1919 cost 40 cents, and if you wanted a moonlight cruise, it was 20 cents extra. Um, those trips were popular with um, church groups and lodges and uh, other social groups. Um, this uh, photo actually shows the passengers disembarking at Stag Island, um, located in the river between Corona and Marysville, Michigan. Stag Island was perfectly located to uh, take advantage of all this passenger traffic going by on the river. Um, and in about 1890, Nelson Mills of Marysville started turning the island into a resort. Um, next slide shows some of the cottages that he built. Uh, these could be rented by the week or even for the entire season. Um, could also stay in the hotel, which is in the next slide. It was originally built as the um, Island House, later renamed the Griffin. It was three stories and had 75 rooms. And uh, next slide shows the LaSalle um, Hall. It was a popular part of recreation on the island. It housed the dining hall and the dance pavilion as well. Um, the next slide shows an interesting artifact from the Moore Museum collection, which is a waffle iron that was used um, in the LaSalle Hall on Stag Island. Uh, next couple of postcards show some of the amenities people enjoyed on the island, a stroll on the boardwalk or canoeing on the St. Clair River. And uh, on the next slide, 
In 1900, a steam yacht owned by the David family provided transportation for passengers from Corona over to Stag Island. Um, in order to generate more income, the David brothers uh, set up a tintype business and they would take photographs um, of the passengers. Um, Fred and Ed David also had um, side tours up the Telford Creek uh, at 25 cents a person. Uh, the next slide shows Telford Creek. Uh, this picture was actually taken by F.J. David on October 8th, 1895. And it's um, one of a series of photos that we have taken by uh, uh, Fred David um, in the museum collection. To increase business, um, Ed David came up with a special attraction um, on these trips. It was a chance to see rare albino turtles. Um, income from that dried up though when somebody captured an albino turtle and the white paint scraped off. Uh, the next slide. Um, longer cruises on the St. Clair River and the rest of the Great Lakes Waterway became popular early in the 20th century. Um, these ships were enjoyed not only by those who could afford the luxury of a trip on one of them, but also by people along the shoreline that could watch them as they sailed past and often could enjoy the music floating across the water as well. Uh, Northern Navigation Division of Canada Steamship Lines offered um, overnight cruises um, or several day cruises on their popular sister ships, the Noronic, the Hamonic, and the Huronic. Uh, this picture is the Noronic, the largest of the, of the fleet. Um, she carried 558 passengers and a crew of 171. Uh, next slide shows that she was lavishly outfitted. Uh, the dining room seated uh, 278 guests. And what you could enjoy in the dining room is shown on the next slide, which is a luncheon menu um, from a Sunday. Unfortunately, not dated as to what year, um, but folks had a choice of uh, four different lunch entrees all accompanied by braised celery and Harvard beets and a choice of four different desserts. Uh, since the dining room didn't accommodate everyone at once, the next slide shows that um, you were assigned to a certain sitting for the meal so that all of the passengers could be accommodated. Next slide shows the sister ship, the Hamonic. Um, Hamonic was likewise a well-appointed ship, uh, just not as large. It accommodated 332 passengers. Uh, the Hamonic offered many facilities, a barbershop, a music room, um, a ballroom. The dining salon had beautiful large windows that you could watch the passing scenery. Um, Canada Steamship Lines ran seven-day passenger cruises uh, from Detroit to Duluth at the Lakehead. And um, this postcard shows the Hamonic returning to the St. Clair River under the Blue Water Bridge. You can date the photo because the Blue Water Bridge is not quite finished. The two stacks that look like they're on the bow of the ship are actually the stacks of the Peerless Cement Company um, in Port Huron. Uh, uh, the next slide is for those who couldn't afford to sail or who preferred to stay on dry land. Uh, the St. Clair River could also be enjoyed from one of the many hotels and resorts that overlook the river. Courtright was a popular resort due to its location on the river. And in 1894, Hotel Bedard was built at a cost of $25,000. Uh, the next slide shows one of the hotels in Corona. Hotels in Corona tended to be smaller, like this one, the Island View House. Um, and uh, the next slide is a brochure for one of the resorts at Corona, the Hilltop. Um, their advertising brochure reads, overlooking the glorious St. Clair River and favored by sunlight, fresh air, and beautiful views from every side, the Hilltop affords all the joys of outdoor life. A variety of recreational facilities, motor boating, fishing, lawn games, rowing, canoeing, swimming, dancing, etc. The hilltop had a dance hall that was built on the river. Uh, it was built in about 1923 and by 1926 attendance at uh, dances for that season was over 13,000 people. So whether aboard one of those luxurious early 20th century cruise ships, floating on a raft, roaring around on a jet ski, having a picnic, or just enjoying the cool breeze on a hot summer day, the St. Clair River forms a beautiful backdrop to summer fun in St. Clair Township. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Laurie. Now we have David McLean. David is a retired high school history teacher who taught for 31 years and is currently a volunteer with the Forest Lambton and Plimpton Wyoming Museums. 
He holds an honors BA in history from Huron College and a Bachelor of Education from Althouse Teachers College. Okay, thank you and a good summer evening to everyone. Um, I was gonna start off, I had a, uh, an image behind me on the screen, they're a virtual image, I guess, but uh, maybe you'll see it later um, and I can talk about it then. Uh, so, um, I'm gonna discuss a few of the activities that folks in and around Forest enjoy during the summer, uh, during summer in days gone by, some of which are certainly still enjoyed today. First, a couple of items from the Forest Museum's collection that pertain to racket sports. So for a little background, um, tennis dates back to France in the, in the 12th century and was first played in Canada in the mid 19th century as a consequence of its growing popularity in England at the time. Badminton, meanwhile, originated in Asia and appears to have been brought to Europe and North America by British military personnel uh, who had been introduced to the sport while stationed in India. So both badminton and tennis became especially popular in our, our area in the early 20th century. And it was a cross Canada tour by a British badminton team in 1925 that apparently did much to spur the growth of that uh, racket sport here, here you know, across Canada and in the United States. Uh, so in this first slide, uh, you'll see on the left, this is, these are both items from our uh, collection in, at the Forest Museum. Uh, you'll see a, a, a vintage 1908 tennis racket with its canvas cover. Uh, the racket was manufactured by the Harry C. Lee Company of New York and is their driver model. Uh, and apparently it's a bit of a rarity. And I, I looked into the, I couldn't find much on the Harry C. Lee Company, other than one interesting, I think currently relevant uh, bit of information. And that company had a, played a role in helping break down the racial barriers for um, minority tennis players back in uh, the midnight, or sorry, the mid uh, 20th century. Um, it was very difficult for um, black tennis players to, to compete at higher levels due to uh, all kinds of restrictions and discrimination and so on. But in the 1950s, um, this company uh, sponsored um, uh, some, some tennis players, including uh, Althea Gibson. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she was a black female tennis player that in 1956 was the first black tennis player to win the Grand Slam in tennis, all right? Um, now the racket on the, the right, of course, is a badminton racket. Um, and it was manufactured by the Harold A. Wilson Company of Toronto and was used by Joan Lahead of Forest. And I'm just guessing on this, maybe somebody who knows a lot more about <laughs> racket sports than I do and their, their history, I'm just guessing, but I think the racket dates to around the 1930s or 40s. That's when Joan would have been uh, probably playing the sports. So that's why I remember those decades. And I, I would have removed it from its guard, but it's a leather cover. When I tried to, to do that, uh, I realized it was quite brittle. So I just left it in place here. Um, okay. So, uh, so the ne next slide. Um, this, this slide here uh, is of personal interest to me, I guess. Uh, if you remember back to our last presentation, I mentioned that both of my grandmothers uh, were survivors of the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918-1919. Well, uh, here's my maternal grandmother, Kathleen Liddell, on the right, uh, standing by a tennis net with her friend, Jesse McIntyre. Uh, in the photo, it, it came from my Nana's album, and it dates to around 1919 or 1920. Um, I think probably after she had come down with the flu and recovered, of course. I'm not certain of the location of the picture, uh, but my grandmother grew up on a farm just outside of Warwick Village, so it might be in that area. So another popular sport, to move on to the next slide, um, uh, another popular sport in the area, um, back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was cricket. Okay. Uh, I know cricket's played around the world today and in Canada and elsewhere, but I've never seen any cricket play in, in the forest vicinity here. Um, but the game originated in England sometime, from what I found out, before the 1600s and was played in forest as early as the late 1870s. The Forest Cricket Club 
um, pictured here, uh, established itself at McFadgen Park on Park Lane, which is really kind of just my backyard here. I live on Park Lane. Uh, the team competed against clubs from Sarnia, Wyoming, Petrolia, Watford, and elsewhere. Uh, but other than a reference I came across to a match played in 1927 at the Old Boys Park, which is Coltis Park today, uh, the sport seems to have declined by popularity here by the 1920s. Now, moving on to the next slide. Like every other community across Canada, Forrest was hit by the bicycle craze in the latter half of the 19th century. The Forrest Bicycle Club, uh, some of whose members are shown in this slide, started up in 1884, and in 1897, a special track for cycling was constructed at McFadden Park. Uh, it is amusing to us now, but back during the bicycle craze, the new contra contraption stirred up much controversy and consternation. It was the era just before the advent of the automobile, and some folk, particularly drivers of horse-drawn wagons, and they were known as Teamsters, took exception to having to share the road with bicycles. And I came across an article from uh, a local newspaper from 1899 entitled Bicycles to stay, and I'm just going to quote a piece from this here, just a short piece. This is from 1899. Bicycles are here to stay, and however much some people may dislike them, it is well to recognize the fact and get used to it. They have the same rights on the highway as any other vehicle and are entitled to half the road. And teamsters who deliberately crowd a bicycle into the ditch are liable for any damage that may result machine or rider. Um, so obviously people back in that day, um, you know, had difficulty getting used to the uh, newfangled contraptions. Um, it should also be noted that as well as the invention of this, um, sorry, it should also be noted as well that the invention of the safety bicycle, and these bikes here would be referred to as safety bicycles, um, uh, that we're familiar today with the two equal size wheels um, uh, had replaced the earlier, and I wish I had an image here, but I'm sure you've seen the penny farthing as it's often called, or the, or the high wheel um, bicycles. The, the safety bicycles had replaced them by, by the 1890s. And so if you can bring up the next slide, please. Um, here we have a photo of the McLaren sisters from uh, just outside of Forest with their safety bikes. And I came across an article written for the Smithsonian Magazine in 2018. And historian Hannah S. Ostroff uh, wrote about the role that bicycles had in changing the lives and fashion of women. And she wrote that, so I'm quoting here for a bit. Bicycles extended women's mobility outside the home. A woman didn't need a horse to come and go as she pleased. Whether to work outside the home or participate in social causes, those who had been confined by Victorian standards for behavior and attire could break conventions and get out of the house. Here she was, out riding a bicycle, wearing bloomers, doing things she wanted to do. The bicycle craze boosted the rational clothing movement, which encouraged women to do away with long, cumbersome skirts and bulky undergarments. Safety bicycle frames accommodated skirts, which got shorter and most daring women chose bloomers that resembled men's pants. A sport corset was designed with elastic for comfort during exercise. The safety bicycle gave women the personal mobility men enjoyed in the 1880s, offering independence from home or husband. It shaped women's identity and increased their visibility, literally, in society." Um, end, of, end of that quote there. So um, it, it's hard to believe now that such a simple thing like a bicycle has such significant consequences. And I should mention here that uh, yes, uh, the McLaren sisters here are wearing fairly long skirts in the photo, not bloomers. Um, apparently they were not full adherents of the rational clothing movement, at least not yet. Uh, whether or not they were wearing sport courses is beyond the realm of my knowledge, as is pretty much everything about women's fashion. Okay, I'll make note of that. So, okay, on to the next slide, please. Um, I had a little bit on golfing here. Sorry to golf fans, but I'm just going to cut this a little bit shorter here. 
So um, another summertime sport with a long history in town is lawn bowling. From what I understand, the sport had its beginnings here in 1886 with the local curling club. These members were looking for a way to keep up their skills in the off season. And I should point out that there's still an active lawn bowling club in force today, playing on the same green that they have for uh, the better part of a century. Okay. And for the next slide, um, and this ties in with uh, Lori, um, Lori's presentation a little bit earlier there. So another summer um, time activity that was very popular was the annual boat excursion on the St. Clair River organized by the 27th Battalion Band, which was made up of members of the Forest Excelsior Band. Beginning in the 1890s and off and on until at least the 1920s, the bands would entertain as many as 600 people aboard vessels like the city of Toledo and the Tashmu, um, pictured in the next slide here. Uh, the passengers would be entertained with the popular music of the day as they made the round trip to Detroit and back, getting back to Star. I'm not sure what time in the morning, couldn't find out when they started, but they get back to Starney about 10 o'clock at night. And um, so that was a very, popular uh, activity for a lot of folk. And I should mention the Excelsior Band is still playing today. Uh, they started up in 1884 and they're still performing. All right, so finally, um, next slide, please. So finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention the sport of baseball, okay? Uh, baseball was still uh, so, sorry, baseball was and still is a very popular sport in our area and throughout the country with men and women, uh, adult and youth, of course, participating. Um, its origins here in Forest date back to at least the 1870s. And Forest teams have competed very successfully at the regional and provincial levels. Uh, so there you have it, uh, just a few of the many ways that locals filled their summer days with sport and entertainment. I don't know if you can be able to see the backdrop uh, behind me here. I don't know if that's going to come up or not, but if it does show up, it's uh, a painting done by uh, Tommy Rumford, who was, uh, his family started up the bakery uh, that our museum is, is located in now. And Tommy, uh, his family, of, co of course, also helped start up the Kinetto Movie Theater. And uh, Tommy was into a lot of different things. He, I, pardon me for the Tommy Rumford fans out there, he wasn't a great artist. He was an amateur artist for sure. But uh, there's a painting I put from the image behind me here that he did of a cottage um, just at Lake Valley Grove, just a five, 10 minute drive from, from Forest out on Lake Huron. So thank you very much. All right, thanks David. Uh, up next, we have Kaylin Shepley. Kaylin is a former summer student and volunteer with Somber Museum and has been um, the museum's curator since the September 2017. She graduated from the University of Waterloo with a Bachelor of Arts in French Studies and a double minor in Applied Languages and International Studies with a focus in history. Her favorite part of her job is working with historical documents in the archives, sharing Sombra's history with the patrons and exploring the collection. Fluent in French and Spanish, Kaylin enjoys learning languages, reading, and listening to nearly anything history-related, photography, and Harry Potter. Greetings, everyone. Um, that's not quite the right photo, but oh. yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, we have a bit of a fun postcard to start off. You can't help having a good time at Sombra. There's always something to do. We have a myriad of these in our collection. Uh, Sombra um, in the summertime really opens up to the party party life, uh, the former Sombra Township, Sombra Village, Port Lambton, Wilkesport, and various other hamlets were a bustling place during the summer months. Free time was spent socializing with friends and family, playing and spectating sports, taking advantage of the St. Clair and Sydenham rivers, and generally taking a break from the long days of toil, the brief spell of hot weather while it lasted. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, I think we need the band photo. Oh, that's the first time. There you go. Okay, this photo of the Sombra band was taken circa the 1880s to 1890s. 
Uh, we dated it using birth records. So um, for some of the, uh, for the subjects of the photo, so we're not quite certain of the date. But Sombra was a music loving town. The church choirs had nearly daily practice. Many took piano lessons and sing alongs for regular evening entertainment. Dancing was also popular with the Grand Union Hotel having its own ballroom and the dance hall next door to it, right on the water. Dances were a regular summer night activity for the young people. The following is a quote from the diary of Jenny Crookshanks, age 18, December 22, 1881. I know this is winter, but it generally illustrates the attitudes of the somber people towards dance. We went up to the hall and made some fun for ourselves. When we saw that there was going to be no crowd, he took a lantern and went off. In a short time, he came back with a fiddler and a fiddle. Then we went in for a good time. Jack Shaw called off and we danced cotillions, polkas, and so on. Will and I tried a circle dance and we managed. All the young professors of the last revival meetings in the spring danced tonight, some who had promised the minister they would not. One lamp was broken. That was paid for. Some plaster fell from the ceiling. That was paid for. I enjoyed myself splendid tonight. I could not have done any more if we had the exhibition. So as you can see, they really cut up and had a good time at their dance nights. Uh, Port Lambton also had the Dance Mirror Dance Hall. It was right out over the water in downtown Port Lambton. The live bands played there at weekends and during the summer. Even years later, discarded alcohol bottles and debris from the dance hall were found in the river near the site, remnants of good times. Our next slide, please. Okay. Baseball, I think. Yes, thank you. Baseball was a popular pastime for children, teens, and adults alike, both male and female. Uh, photos as far back as the 1890s show a group of somber township men and women, bats and gloves in hand, ready to defend their team in town pride. The photos on the screen show the Plum Creek girls team from 1925 and the Wilkesport boys team from 1915. Baseball wasn't just a casual pastime either. Wilkesport fielded a string of intermediate and senior regional and provincial champions in the 1950s and 60s with finalists up to the year 2000 and Port Lambton has also fielded championship teams from the 1970s to present. It was the definite favorite among the locals. Now the next slide. Thank you. Okay, now we get to the Sombra racetrack. It was developed in 1892 and lasted until 1914. The half mile oval built east of the railway tracks and a thousand spectators were said to have attended the inaugural event. The local hotel owners supported the track through ads in the Sombra Outlook newspaper and the track drew entrance from all over southwestern Ontario. Each season could be guaranteed to draw crowds to the grandstand to pass away time cheering for their favorite horse, likely placing a few bets and enjoying um, food and good drink. Our next slide, please. Okay, this is a view of morning training. Sorry, the photos are just a little out of order. Okay. I'm sorry, is this it? Okay, summer wouldn't be complete without a ride across the St. Clair River to Marine City to visit friends and family and perhaps take in a movie and ice cream at the cinema in Marine City. From about 1880 until 2018, Sombra residents were able to hop on the ferry for a summer day trip across the river for shopping and other entertainment. Port Lambton also had a ferry that went to Roberts Landing, Michigan, um, which was very popular with the locals until the 1980s. And next, please. Okay. So here we have the morning training at Ohio Cottage in Port Lambton. Port Lambton was a resort town uh, incorporated into a police village in 1921. So summer, the population increased greatly. Visitors from Detroit, Sarnia, and elsewhere flocked to the village by boat, car, and train to get away from the bustle of urban life, relax with light exercise, and enjoy a pleasant view and maybe a good book, as you see the man on the porch do doing. Uh, the ladies are doing like calisthenic type exercises. Um, next slide, please. Here we have the Grand Union Hotel in Sombra. Uh, even today, sitting on the porch or the dock with a cool drink is the perfect way to spend a summer day. Residents and visitors alike of Sombra um, gathered on the balconies of the Grand Union built in 1906. 
to, been pictured here to enjoy the view and have a good visit. The Grand Union even featured a rooftop garden for looking out over the town and the river. Men and women could be found on porches and verandas and in hardware stores throughout the summer of many, at many local businesses, trading gossip and enjoying the weather. You may have even run into a notorious gangster or two, as Al Capone was known to frequent the area during Prohibition and the rum running days. Next, please. Here we have the um, grandstand built in Sombra along Water Street, which is right on the St. Clair River. Uh, this, these were built in 1933 for the 1933 edition of the Harmsworth, Harmsworth Cup Trophy Series um, races that would pit American driver Garwood and his Miss America X against many international competitors to defend their motorboat racing title for the ninth straight time. 325,000 spectators gathered in boats and on grandstands along the St. Clair River to watch the and St. Lake St. Clair to watch the trophy competition, which took place over a week or so during the summer. Since 1921, the Harmsworth Cup had been hosted by Detroit, so the action could be observed all along the shoreline and was near a near annual tradition for the people of Sombra, Fort Lambton, and Sombra Township. It was a treat for the people to see the internationally renowned competition, which was begun in England in 1903. Speedboat races are still popular today along the St. Clair, St. Clair River, as Laurie mentioned, um, around Courtright every July. We can still enjoy the races. Next slide, please. Okay, that's not the right one. Yes, thank you. So here we see, that's not the right one either. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, here we see a dress, um, the fishing and mine. Can you mm -hmm. go back? Yep. Thank you. Here we see um, the dock at Waddell's in Port Lampton. Uh, the children are enjoying a picnic lunch. Uh, with the family. Uh, if you owned, if you lived on the river, you likely had a dock and were able to go rowboating and swimming on a daily basis. Um, if you might even have visitors, uh, the Sarnia Yacht Club visited in 1913 uh, to Sombra for a day out on the water and picnicking. Next slide, please. Here we have fishing and mining at Bear Creek in Wilkesport. Uh, people would visit Sombra on the train or by car and then rent a um, hack from the livery stable in Sombra to go up to Wilkesport or they may even borrow a car or if they were lucky enough to own their own, they would drive out to the Sydenham for a day of fishing and picnicking along the Sydenham River. Next slide, please. Here we have the Hotel Victoria in Port Lambton. Uh, popular activities included strolls along the river under the willows, which were renowned in Port Lambton. Uh, in 1880s, um, it, it was a common pastime for the residents of Sombra and Port Lambton to stand out on the dock and wave at passing ships and call out to their sweethearts and family and friends that they knew on the ships. Uh, sailors would even hop off either at the dock or they would just um, jump onto a passing rowboat or even swim into the shore and come up for a visit and then meet their ship when it was heading back the other way on the river. And next slide, please. Okay, here we have the picnic under the willows at Port Lambton. This is just um, north of the down where the downtown is today. Uh, family visits would often lead to spontaneous picnics and the um, groups such as the Wallaceburg um, Knights of Columbus, no, KFC, yes, Knights of, I did not write that down, Knights of Columbus, I believe it is, uh, would bring uh, out two steak trucks full of families and have great picnics at the park in Port Lambton. Uh, this is recounted by Mildred Atkins, who grew up in Port Lambton, and these would happen during the 30s and the 40s. Um, here you can see that they have a canoe. Uh, canoe boats and racing and swimming were all popular activities. Another popular spot was in Courtright. They called it the Seegers. Uh, one account is that the family would jump in the Oldsmobile and go to the Seegers and have a picnic 
on a Sunday afternoon and enjoy the drive along the river. Um, the games and activities commonly enjoyed at the picnics included game of braces, which used two, two sticks and a hoop covered in cloth ribbons and you would throw them back and forth. Only young girls were, or, were, or a boy-girl pair were allowed to play. Boys were not allowed to play this game together. Other common games were the egg and spoon and stick and hoop, which was the one where you have the stick and you try to roll the hoop. Uh, there were different versions for boys and girls. Uh, girls would use usually a wooden hoop and the boys were allowed to use an iron or metal hoop. At one point, this toy um, was so popular that they were considering laws to ban the toy as they, they theorized that boys were causing horses' legs to break and injuring the legs of pedestrians. Um, next slide, please. Here we have swimming and boating on the St. Clair River. Um, uh, these were the most popular pastimes as you didn't need to travel or have any equipment or much planning. You could just hop on down to the river. Uh, the Jenny Crookshank diary mentioned once that Jenny went down to the river with her tin cup and parasol in hand and lost both during their excur spontaneous excursion with 10 friends on the river as they were swimming and frolicking under the willows. Next slide, please. Here we have the steamer Tashmu, mentioned by both Lori and David. Um, Tashmu Park uh, was a popular destination for tourists all up and down the St. Clair River and Great Lakes. Uh, it would stop in Port Lambton to drop off and pick up passengers. And that was one of the other popular activities. Um, it, some passengers would often leave at Port Lambton or be left off at Port Lambton and were able to stay in the resort hotels there. Next slide, please. Here I have two recipes. That's not quite the correct one, I believe. Yes, that's the correct one. Here we have a view of some of the items from our collection. It's set up as a picnic. We have the parasol for ladies would not want to become tanned or freckled. Um, on the upper left there, we have the picnic um, ice cream freezer. This one particular one was rented from a creamery in Wallaceburg and then bought by the Port Lambton United Church and used for their picnics uh, to store ice cream. Every picnic seemed to have an ice cream in all of the records and accounts. You would want ice cream. The children would sometimes eat so much that they couldn't uh, row in their boats. They were just too full to row. Uh, we have a jug here dated from 1890 to 1914, the cork in it. That would be what you would put your lemonade in for the picnic. Lemonade was a standard at any picnic. And then on the lower left, we have the tin cup. Uh, you didn't take the fine china on a picnic um, in Victorian and Edwardian times. And then we have the enamel tea pot uh, for brewing your tea with the accompanying tea egg. The solid copper kettle for boiling the water. Uh, you would also take in a uh, gas light of some sort or a fuel lantern of some sort to heat the kettle. Uh, we have a tin of tea, some uh, tin salt and pepper shakers which would have been used after 1911. Before that they used salt and pepper cellars as salt was not uh, portable at that point. We have the knife and fork. Um, most of the time they would use wood or um, tin uh, knives and forks. We don't have any in the collection, so this is our sample of silver. We have the plate and bowl for ice cream. Oftentimes they would bring a fancier bowl for the ice cream. And then we have the tiny little spoon. It's actually made of tin and it's specifically for ice cream. Uh, you would also take your plain handkerchiefs. And then we have a carriage blanket used as the picnic blanket. Um, sometimes you would even bring a table and chairs. And then if you were having an especially high-end meal, you might bring the fireless cook stove, which was like a crock pot. You used stones and heated them in the, um, on the fire, and then you would boil your stew or bake a bread or cake, and then use the stones to continue the cooking. And then when you were ready to eat, your food was ready. Uh, next slide. Um, 
1800s into the early 1900s, the sandwich um, was really in its heyday. Uh, that was the standard picnic food. I have a couple of recipes here. You notice that um, tongue is one of the ingredients. Almost every recipe um, for a sandwich called for tongue at the time. It's a very popular snack. And then I mentioned the popularity of lemonade. So I left a lemonade recipe for everyone. And you notice that it's a cooling and refreshing drink, especially in cases of fever. And the lemon can also be used for other foods such as vegetables and fish. These recipes were taken from the home, um, home education book of 1905 for students. Next slide. Okay, to finish up the summer every year was the Wilkesport Fair. So as you can see, it's 25 cents for adults, uh, 25 cents per car, and other than school children was 10 cents. Um, if you're not caught by the 22nd, meet me at the Wilkesport Fair. Often they would have catchy slogans like this. Um, it was run by the Sombra Agricultural Society um, in a field in Wilkesport. And you can see the events for the 50th annual were horse races, bicycle races, hog calling, husband calling, ball games by schools, school parades, and race drills. Um, some of the race drills may have included sack racing. I didn't mention, but there was always a sack race or some sort of race at the picnics. So that was one of the most popular summer activities for any gathering. Um, next slide, please. This is my final slide. So uh, this always took place at the end of September. Again, we have the Wilkesport Fairgrounds and the groups of people um, by the hundreds who are enjoying the last hurrah of summer. So thank you, that's everything from me. Thank you, Kaylin. All right, so lastly, uh, let me introduce Glenn Stott. Glenn is a retired educator and amateur local historian who has a special interest in the War of 1812 and early settlement. He has written numerous books on our local history, including a reflection on the local impacts of the War of 1812. So Glenn, you just have to unmute yourself. There you go. And speak up. <laughs> okay, I'll have to really speak up. First of all, I want to focus, this is a 1966 Mustang, the 1966, and that's where I'm going to focus. I was a young person. I had taught for a couple of years, and I was able to buy a brand new Mustang. And I, my parents had a cottage at Port Franks. And I want to tell you right now, from Port Franks to Kettle Point, in 1966 were the finest beaches in North America, if not the world. And the beauty was you could drive all the way from Port Franks all the way to Kettle Point with very little interruption along the beach. In the 1960s, the beach was wide, 50 to 100 meters wide. And in that case, so I'm going to review a beach run from Port Franks to Kettle Point and back very quickly. First of all, you went along Riverside Drive in Port Franks and you crossed over the old rickety bridge over Mud Creek. Now, rickety bridge is really an understatement. The boards actually moved with you as you drove over it. And uh, it was replaced in the 1970s, but it had atmosphere. And as soon as you got over the bridge, you turned immediately right onto what's now called Creek Trail. And that led along the Longwood or the Mud Creek, which was a very uh, narrow road, but it was maintained. And you could go all the way down to the beach, right down to where Mud Creek emptied into Lake Huron. And there was a spot there that you had to really gun your engine to get it through the sand. But once you got there, you had that 50 meters to 100 meter wide beach. It was so wide that people could park either uh, facing the sand dune perpendicular to the beach or facing the beach and still had room for people to have their picnics and their uh, beach blankets and swimming on the lake. It was absolutely an amazing thing. Now, uh, on the beach, uh, it was, there were all kinds of people. And it was the place to be. When you're young in 1966, to be in a hot car like a 1966 Mustang was absolutely incredible. 
and you would go up the beach to show people the, hey, look at me, I've got a 1966 Mustang. And uh, people would be there and would look and uh, all the racing cars, the Malibus and the Impalas and the, oh, a few Camaros. The, most people wouldn't have bought a Camaro in those days. Um, you drove along the beach from Port Franks all the way to the army camp. Now, the army camp had posts up, but you could drive through there and go along the army camp. Now, not as many people parked on the army camp because and swam because it was basically the summer camp for cadets. And oftentimes the kids would come down and they had to close off the beach. So you had to take your chances. But oftentimes people stopped at that Stony Point, which was a, a rock outcrop that went out into Lake Huron. And some people, and this is 1966 before the environmental people uh, started telling us all the things we were doing. And uh, they would stop and drive out on the rocks and wash their cars. Now that just absolutely think, Ugh. but also Clark's garage in Thedford did an amazing job when the lake level all of a sudden came up and people found that their cars were swamped and they wouldn't start. They charged $5 a tow. So the Clark's garage in Thedford made a lot of money from that. Now you drove through the beach all the way along the Army camp, and then you came to the Provincial Park, Ipperwash Provincial Park, which was an absolute no-no. You couldn't drive across the beach because there was no beach. There was a rock outcrop, and the park uh, occupied that. So you turned up a small road that went from along the Army camp and the Ipperwash until you got to Army camp road, and then you joined back on to Ipperwash. So you missed Ipperwash Provincial Park. You go on Google Earth, you can follow it fairly closely. And then again, you are back on the beach and people parked on the beach both ways, fore and aft, depending on the width of the beach. And it would vary from 50 meters to 100 meters. But it was very, very, very popular. And uh, then you would go all the way down through Ipperwash. You could stop at the casino at Ipperwash Casino if you wanted to get a milkshake or whatever. But you did drive and you went all the way and you could go all the way through to Kettle Point. And uh, then you would make your way through Kettle Point, through the reserve, back to Highway 21. Or if you enjoyed the trip, you just simply did a U-turn at Kettle Point and start all the way back to Port Franks. And it would take a half an hour to an hour drive. It was absolutely an incredible experience. And I, unfortunately, you people will never experience that because it's closed down. By the mid-1970s, the beach levels uh, fluctuated, the la lake levels fluctuated, and they climaxed in 1986, the beach was at its highest, then again, 2019 and 2020, they're back up again as high. But in the 19, by the early 1970s, driving along the beach was a no-no, and uh, they uh, stopped it. Now, I want to talk about camping. Because the, this area, Lampton Shores, had incredible camping things. You had Pine Ridge Provincial Park. You had Ipperwash Provincial Park. You had an incredible number of private campgrounds. And to go to the Pinery in 1966, if you had a tent and didn't require any services, you could get a campsite for $1.50 a night. And uh, if you were a member of a church group or a youth group, you could rent the group camping area in Pinery for free. It actually, you had to just register ahead of time. And there was no having to book ahead. You could simply go into the camp. If it was a busy, May 24th weekend was the busiest. But after that, you could probably get any campsite you wanted as long as you were tenting. And it went wrong. Picnics, uh, you could go to the Pinery. You could go to Ipperwash. Those had day use camps or day use permits, and they were a dollar a piece. So uh, you, you, they were affordable. And then if you know anything about Highway 21 north of Northville, past the uh, 79 outlet, I guess it is, uh, there were two conservation areas called Thedford Conservation Area 1 and Thedford Conservation Area 2 on either side of the cut, the Sabo River cut. And those were large 
can or picnic areas for day use, and they were free, and people would use those for picnicking. And then if you drove along through the pinery or by the pinery, there was an OPP station on the right, and the Ontario provincial government had set up a large camping or a picnic area for day use, and that was available as well. Now I'll just talk about dancing. The of course you talked about um, Upper Wash Casino was available, and uh, the Lakeview Casino at Grand Bend were great. Even in 1966, I remember going there for a dollar twenty-five per person, which was incredibly expensive, uh, and had an evening dance. And uh, but it must have closed down after that. Um, the things that have occurred in since 66 that have caused this, the fact that this beach run will never happen again are the depth of the lakes fluctuated, the First Nations and land claims issues of uh, the Army Camp and Upper Wash Provincial Park, cottage demands for lots on along Lake Huron have increased. And of course, I've reached the point where I don't think there's any more room. And the um, lake, the beach level, you would be hard pressed to find two meters of beach, let alone 50 to 100 meters of beach. And so with the lake level so high, there's not going to be that for a long, long time to come. And also, the population of Ontario in 1966 was roughly 7 million people. And the population 2020 is 15 million. And that, and, and you think of the number of provincial parks that aren't anymore, and the number of picnic areas that aren't anymore. Lampton Shores is really hard pressed to handle the demand that there is right now. It's a, but Lampton Shores, the beaches were just the most exquisite. They, they simply shadowed, they made a shadow of Port Stanley. And, uh, and by the 1960s, uh, uh, Upper Wash, Port Franks, and Grand Bend were outdoing uh, Port Stanley, which was falling into bad use. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Glenn. Um, just quickly before we get to the Q&A, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about a few things that are happening. Um, so although the museums and archives remain closed at the moment, we do still have some exciting projects and programs that we've been working on uh, behind the scenes in anticipation of reopening um, and welcoming you all back. So Lambton County Archives is still uh, collecting COVID stories. So if you have any photos or short stories you would like to share to help preserve history in the making, you can head to their website, which is lamptonarchives.ca to learn more. Um, and they will be presenting an exhibition at Sarnia Library this fall on the history of music in Lambton County. And it's created in partnership with the Lambton Concert Band. So you can learn about the county's musical past through an informative, an informative display featuring sights and sounds of our past. Um, more museum site does still remain closed to the public at this time with a decision on reopening um, expected in early September. So while visitors cannot be welcomed in person, staff are working behind the scenes to continue the work of preserving the history of the former Moore Township section of St. Clair Township and sharing this heritage. More historical information is being added to the museum's website through virtual exhibits. Currently available at moormuseum.ca are Villages of Moore and Banishing Villages of Moore Township. Currently in production are histories of the churches and schools that were part of the social fabric of the former Moore Township. In addition to the museum's Facebook page, you can watch for news on the Moore Museum Instagram, which is at Moore Museum. And for more information, you can even visit their Contact Us page on their website. They are also conducting online an online survey and requesting community input. Survey respondents will be entered into a draw that will be held November 13. And it's to win a 2021 family membership and a $25 gift certificate for the gift shop. Lastly, the Oil Museum um, of Canada National Historic Site is preparing to open to the public September 9th. The hours will be Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., and Thursdays with new extended hours, which is 11 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Time tickets will be available for registration on the website or by calling the museum. 
You can support all of our museums by purchasing an individual or family membership through one of our Heritage Sarnia Lambton Network Museums. And along with all the other benefits, you will be receiving our quarterly, quarterly newsletter, Lambton Musings, which includes news updates, featured exhibits and events, and historical stories. Uh, so before we wrap up, we did have a couple um, kind of comments and questions that came through. Uh, the first one I saw, I think it's either for Dana or Nicole, about the program. Um, and uh, Jackie, if you can clarify, um, she was asking if it was published in Ohio, because the Woodstock Public Library has a similar looking one, but theirs is in a play format. She said she's referring to the start of the Petrolia presentation. I don't know, Jack, if you want to <laughs> jump in there, but. If it's about this one, I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. Um, I don't think this one was published in Ohio, but I did find letters because this was part of the 1946 one. Um, there were letters that came back from multiple areas in the United States, including um, Georgia, California, all, kind of all over, um, that expressed interest in coming here. So there might actually be a copy of this program with one of the residents that had moved from Petrolia down to one of those areas that came back for one of these reunions. So. Um, I think there was another comment about the photographs of the, all the ships from Laurie's presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and she said they would make a nice addition to Walter Lewis Maritime's history of the Great Lakes if they haven't already been shared with him. So there's a comment for, uh, for Laurie, not really a question, but we didn't get to too many questions today. Very thorough. Oh, someone did ask, Glenn, if you tried to drive through, oh, where was it now? Um, did you try to drive through the creek from one side of each to the other? <laughs> you're, you're muted uh, there, Glenn, if you're answering. Get to unmute. <laughs> There you go. No, I no, I never tried to do that. I uh, first of all, it was a brand new car, and I didn't want to get stuck. And I I was not a very good driver, so I uh, didn't want to take a chance. No, you stayed away from that. But uh, driving in the sand on the beach sometimes was a bit of a uh, you could get stuck. And as I said, there was a tow truck service out of Thetford that made quite a bit of money that summer. Or those all right. Um, oh, she's saying that she did it at Port Franks and her station wagon made it through. So there you go, Glenn. <laughs> She's a better driver than I am. <laughs> um, all right, so we don't have any other questions. Oh, wait, there might have been one more. Did Al Capone dock his yacht in Sombra? Um, Al Capone, let me know, we know he was here. He definitely was a visitor of the Grand Union Hotel. Um, in fact, he actually gave my great grandmother her nickname. She was the barmaiden and he called her Effie. Her name was Evelyn. So we know he was here in Zombra and he had meetings, but um, as far as we know, he didn't have his, do his yacht docked here, although his yacht was sold to someone else and actually sunk at the Port Lambton Marina. We have the well, porthole from his yacht here in our museum collection. That's neat. There you go. All right. So last call for questions. <laughs> um, on behalf of the Heritage uh, Sarnia Lambton, I would like to thank all of you for continuing your support of the local museums as we reopen. It's with your continued support that we're able to conduct ongoing research and preserve our local history and stories of our communities. And that does bring us to the end. We did uh, run over, so thank you guys for sticking with us. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, so that's the, the end of the webinar, Fun in the Sun, Past Summer Recreation in Sarnia Lambton. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I hope you have a very great, safe um, evening. All right. Goodbye.